I didn't grow up living a very healthy lifestyle. Like I grew up eating um, cereal, not the good cereal, like Cocoa Puffs, Cocoa Krispies, Pop-Tarts. Um, for dinner, we typically had like spaghetti or hot dogs or pizza, tacos, those type of things, all the good stuff, you know? And so um, as I got a little bit older, I had a grandfather pass away with, um, he had dementia, but he also had some sort of cancer that never did quite figure it out. Come on in. Um, I had I had an aunt right now who uh, started having strokes at the age of 48 years old. She's had uh, countless strokes now in the last five years. Um, my grandpa's had four heart attacks. Dad's not, dad has type two diabetes. My mom has high blood pressure, uh, cholesterol issues. My stepdad has type two diabetes. So like, and I think everyone can kind of name several family members who have that stuff going on. And so I started diving into some research, not just with uh, nutrition, but with chiropractic care and exercise and just really understand what helps us get healthy and help, what helps us prevent that stuff from going on. I find that with nutrition, um, mindset is a little bit off with most people when it comes to going on a diet or, or just approaching nutrition in a certain way. And what I mean by that is um, I have a friend who, while I was in chiropractic school, I started in 2010 in chiropractic school, and that's when um, the HCG uh, drops, the, it's like a pregnancy hormone. Um, there's a diet with it where you eat like 500 calories a day or something ridiculous like that. And then you take these drops and it tricks your body to thinking that it's pregnant for some or It's weird, but you lose a bunch of weight with it. So I was looking into it because I knew it was like a hot thing uh, that everyone was doing. And um, lo and behold, it's not a good idea to trick your body hormonally to uh, think it's pregnant, especially for men. And so my brother, actually, well, I already did I was gonna say my friend, but it, it's actually my brother. Uh, he's a year and a half older than me. He's severely obese, um, as, as the rest of my family. And he asked me, he sent me a text. He's like, hey, can you get me some HCG drops for cheap? And I was like, so you want to lose weight or what you want to do? And he's like, yeah. I said, well, I wouldn't recommend HCG drops. Or, you know, the side effects, the long-term side effects is dangerous. Um, if you want a nutrition plan and a workout plan, just let me know and I can put some together for you. But I wouldn't recommend doing that. And uh, he goes, I wasn't looking for your opinion. I was looking to see if you could get it for cheap for me. I was like, okay, well, health, health, uh, disregard health altogether. If you don't want my opinion um, and you just want to lose weight, I told him, I was like, this is not my health recommendation, by the way. I said, uh, you should start doing cocaine. Because if you know anyone who's hooked on cocaine, what are they? They're really frail and skinny, right? And so I was like, well, if you just want to lose weight, I mean, that's a, that's a viable option. And uh, he didn't text me back. But anyway, he's actually, uh, since then, he's lost like 80-something pounds, which is awesome. He's been doing it. A more correct way, he's not been doing HCG, so good friend. But anyway, um, that I feel like that's our mindset though when it comes to nutrition. It's very short-lived. Um, like it's a number, like we want to see on a scale, or it's a size we want to fit into, or it's a summer coming up, so we want to, you know, look a certain way. We want to fit in a wedding dress. Whatever the case is, we have these these smaller goals, which aren't bad necessarily, but they're not going to keep driving you to to continue on a path of health and wellness and if you're not on that path you're on the path of unhealth and disease and all this stuff that everyone else is seeing i mean it's it's rampant in everyone's families in fact everyone put your hand up for me for a second if you have been affected or know someone in your family who's been affected with heart disease go ahead and lower your hand okay now cancer that has or has not has, has been affected by, oh yeah sorry sorry so, I mean, every, everyone, literally, I, there could be 150 people in this room and I doubt any hands would be up with just heart disease and cancer, right? And so we have to start thinking more on that and how to, how to prevent that stuff from happening. And you can do that through nutrition. Nutrition is very powerful. I hate the word cure. I, I absolutely hate the word cure. I think it's a, being used as a big money maker, but our body has the ability to cure anything. God put that ability inside of our body to do that as long as we give it the right fuel, okay? And so when it comes to, there, there's a lot of problems with, um, 
on this PowerPoint one. Okay. With just wanting to look a certain way, because especially women, at a very young age, you're taught that you're supposed to look a certain way, right? You see the magazine articles, you see the athletes, but they they don't not they do not tell you the whole story. Like there's a lot of genetic things going on here that allow women to look a certain way. And just being overweight or obese does not make you sick by itself. Because there are plenty, I would say just as many skinny sick people as there are overweight sick people. Right? It, just being overweight by itself does not have an effect on your health. However, it's the it's the lifestyle that gets someone there in that first place is what makes you unhealthy. Right? And so we don't have to worry about fitting into a certain or looking a certain way. If we start changing that lifestyle, we know our body's getting healthy, regardless of what the scale says. That now, usually, if you start changing your diet and exercise, all that stuff, a good side effect is weight loss. But it's not going. It, we have de several different body types. You have the, the uh, Carrie Underwood, the model, the athlete, the CrossFitter. So don't worry about what you look like, because. Everyone should know this. these two people. You know, in the 80s, every, every man wanted to be him and every man wanted her. Um, so they, they looked the part, right? They looked healthy. But we all, do you guys know how these two end up passing away? He had um, pancreatic and she had, I think, colon maybe? Something. He ended up getting chemo brain. So um, chemo brain is whenever... It's a side effect of, of chemo where it makes them go kind of psychotic. And this was apparently an episode of his, psych, before he died, his psycho, whatever. Um, and then, but the thing is, is health does not have a look, right? So um, my, I just went through a little bit of a health scare not too long ago, because I'm not standing up here saying I'm perfect by any means. Um, in the past five years, we had, well, my daughter turns three on Tuesday. So in the last four years, whenever my wife got pregnant, I really let my, particularly my nutrition go downhill a little bit. I put that on the back burner. And it, I just haven't quite got it back into gear. Um, in January, I had um, severe uh, severe pain here with every breath in. Um, it started, Dr. Matt's mom actually passed away that same week, so he was out. And so I was adjusting and it was before the whole COVID thing. And so I, I actually, on Thursday, I adjusted, I think it was like 115 people all day. And usually when I do that, I'm pretty sore. And as you can imagine. And so I just thought I was sore, went home. I, I Friday, I came in here, worked for a few hours and I started to feel some, some back pain. And I actually texted Dr. Matt, I was like, hey, you gotta meet me on Saturday morning before my shift to adjust me because it's getting bad. I just thought I had a rib out or something. And um, that night, I it was getting worse and worse. I laid down. Um, I could only lay on my left side for some reason. And um, I, I fell asleep, rolled to my right side, and an hour later I woke up and I couldn't move. Like I rolled out of bed, I was on my hands and knees, could barely go off the floor, and I told my wife, I was like, I should probably do something about this. I don't think it's a rib anymore. And um, so my best friend had a, a collapsed lung in high school, and I knew the, so taller, uh, skinnier men have um, collapsed lungs just randomly sometimes. So I was like, okay, my lungs probably collapsing for some reason, so we need to get to the ER. I uh, got there, my lung was good, or my, as far as collapsing was good. So they did a CT scan, they found that I had a, a large, they didn't tell me how big, they just kept saying a very large blood clot in my lung, my left, lower lobe of my left lung. It killed part of my lung. Um, so I was in the hospital, then they let me go, and then the, the next night I went back because everything from here over was spasming up. I mean, it was, I thought I was dying, and so I went back, was in the hospital three days that time on a lot of drugs, and so from then on, it like kicked me into gear. I'm like, okay, like when you go through that, because prior to that, I've always been um, healthy, I've always felt healthy, and uh, I kind of thought I was gonna live forever, <laughs> and then you realize, oh, we are, vulnerable to this stuff, everyone is. And so I've lost, I, I got full of my nutrition. Um, I started exercising again on a more regular basis, very consistent. Um, I've lost 24 pounds, but that's not the case. It, I do that not to lose weight, 
I do it to make sure that, you know, my daughter doesn't see me in the hospital room again. Cause I never would have thought that would have been me um, prior to January. So when I talk about nutrition, that's the mindset I'm coming across is, is we have to be there for, for the people we care about. So let's look at the stats here. Cause we're all in this together here, especially in our country. 48% uh, of Americans drink soda at least once a day. So I'm gonna talk about um, five different changes we can make to try to not become a stat here. Um, there's a lot of sugar in soda, which we'll cover. 70% of caloric intake is from processed foods. More than seven tenths of what we put in our bodies is processed. So even homemade stuff anymore, a lot of it's processed. Um, whether you get the, the box dinners, I think. So when I was in college, I, I lived on pizza rolls and hot dogs and pizzas and all that stuff. So that's why I think about it. I ate at home, but it was all still processed stuff. 80% um, of popular U.S. foods contain ingredients banned in other countries. And when I say banned, I don't, so I used to, I've covered this a lot um, as far as this talk goes. I've been doing it for several years. I used to think banned just meant like a slap on the wrist. Um, but I had a patient who had a daughter in the military. She was stationed in Germany. And so he went over there for a whole month and visited her. And at some point they were at a restaurant talking to a cook. I don't know if she knew him. I don't know the situation. But anyway, he, they were going to talk about nutrition. And he said that if he got caught putting the same ingredients in food over there that we do in here in our country, he could get life in prison with some of the ingredients. I mean, it's poison. And so... <clears throat> We, we, for whatever reason, have not banned a lot of stuff here in our country, and we just consume it. Only 59% of meals served at home are homemade, and an average American ingests 150 pounds of additives every single year. So these are additives that, you know, back in the 50s and 60s were not in our food. Over 3,000 additives are approved a year to be put in our nutrition. If you just look at the back of the ingredient list, you're gonna see I mean, just take a, a loaf of bread, right? Bread's not supposed to have a ton of stuff in it, but if you look at the greens like bunny bread, it's a super long list of a bunch of junk that they put in there. So we'll cover that in a second too. So I'm gonna go through five changes. Number one is slash your sugar. So if you want to, um, I mean, heck, if you wanna lose weight, if you wanna look better, feel better, um, have more energy, if you want to make sure your body's not building cancer on a day-to-day -day basis, then these five changes have to be made at some point. They don't have to be made all at one time, okay? Please do not, like if you have never really made a change to your nutrition or you just kind of live the standard American diet, please do not make all five of these changes at once because you'll fail most likely. Because we all have, um, number one, this is why most people fail, is sugar is super duper addictive. So sugar, they did MRIs on people on their brain to look at the serotonin levels of feel good hormones that light up. And so if you're addicted to something, those are gonna light up whenever you're introduced to a stimulus that, that you're addicted to. And so they um, they gave people sugar, and I don't know how they did this, but you can look it up. You can look, I need to get the actual MRI up there. But they gave people cocaine, and they, they found that sugar actually lights up the serotonin levels more in the brain than, than cocaine does. So it's, it's more addictive than that. So has anyone ever tried to cut sugar out of their diet ever? Is it? You cut it down? It's super hard. Like no, I've never talked to anyone and said, oh yeah, it's a piece of cake, right? Because it, it, it would be like a cocaine addict getting off cocaine. It really would. I mean, if you can cut all sugar out, and not just sugar, but things that turn to sugar, like bread and um, crackers and pasta and all that stuff. So it's hidden in everything. So pasta sauce, lunch meats, condiments. Um, I find that a lot of people, we're, we're all our own worst enemy and our biggest critic is ourselves, right? And so I've had people do really good cutting, off, cutting down sugar for a good several months and they lost a ton of weight and then they, they mess up, usually on the holidays when we mess up or like a graduation or birthday party or something like that. They'll mess up one time and they're like, oh, I knew I couldn't do it, I suck. And then they'll go back to their old ways. And I don't know why we tend to do that, especially with nutrition, because we don't typically do that with anything else. Like I mess up on a day-to-day -day basis, trust me, especially like 
with everything that we do in here, there's always something that I forget or I don't do right or whatever. I never ever say, well, I guess I'm just gonna quit, right? I guess I'm just gonna go sit at home. And we don't do that with anything else, but for whatever reason, when we make one little mistake, especially if we've been doing good, we just tend to throw in the towel. So I encourage you guys, do not try to shoot for perfection with this. Um, one good thing I, I've seen people do is they, you know, if you take a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle, if you're trying to change your nutrition, just write everything down that you've eaten throughout the day. Have a good side and a bad side. So if you eat um, whatever, Pop-Tarts, that you eat on the bad side. If you add an apple, you put on the, the good side. And at the end of the day, just see how you do. And then the next day, do it again and try to get this side, the good side, bigger, the bad side, smaller, and that's success. Like that, you don't have to have nothing on the bad side and all good stuff, but if your lists are, are balancing out or the good side's getting better, then that's success, right? And so um, when we eat sugar, this is how much we, we typically eat of high fructose corn syrup is 63 pounds and 156 pounds of sugar in this country, this is USDA research did this. That's per person per year. So in uh, the early 1900s, that number was closer to like 50. So then if you look at all the stats of everything, the, the diabetes, um, I mean, heck, they, you can't even call type two adult onset anymore because so many kids are, are getting type two diabetes. Um, cancer is severe, childhood cancers even. Um, there's almost no just adult chronic diseases anymore that you cannot find in children like there used to be. So it all comes down to what fuel we put in our body. Sugar is an anti-nutrient. It actually steals and robs nutrients from your cells. Obviously it increases your risk of diabetes, it increases your risk of heart disease because whenever we eat sugar, our body can only, now our body can process some sugar, about 19 grams a day, okay? And so if we just get that in, our body knows what to do with it, turn in energy, all that good stuff. But above that, what our body does, it turns it into fat. And so, and, and then what that does causes inflammation. So it's an, it's an inflammatory uh, nutrient. And so the big thing with heart disease, a lot of people think that it's just cholesterol that causes heart disease. And that's absolutely through research that med medical doctors have done, that is not what heart causes heart disease. Just think about it. Cholesterol lowering drugs, statins, are I think number one or number two prescribed drug in the country. If, if everyone with high cholesterol has taken a statin, what should we see the rates of heart disease do? If cholesterol causes heart disease, right? It's just logical that if we, if, if cholesterol, lowering cholesterol helped reduce heart disease, our heart disease numbers should go down. But guess what they're doing? They're only going up. Right? They're, they've actually said that it, it appears that cholesterol just actually kills you quicker because your body actually, your liver produces cholesterol and sends it out to the body where there's damage. And so it's going out to these bad arteries and it's, heal, it's trying to heal that. What's happening is we're just keep damaging them over and over again. So our body is sending more and more cholesterol and that's what's clogging our arteries. So it's true that, you know, we're having clogged arteries from cholesterol but the, the culprit of it is not the cholesterol itself. Does that make sense? It'd be like if we drove around Cape County and um, went to every bit of roadkill and we examined it and, and it had maggots and bugs eating it, we, we, could, we could say, well, I guess the, the maggots killed the animal. Like, because every dead animal has maggots, right? <clears throat> but that's not the case. It's a response that's happening there, just the same way as cholesterol. That's how they've linked it in, in research. They, they said everyone with, high, or everyone with heart disease has high cholesterol. That's true, but it's not a, it's not a, a, a causative relationship. Sugar is what causes a lot of damaged arteries because we're just getting too much of it. So it's, it's associated with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, promotes cancer growth. So a cancer cell has eight times the receptor site on it for sugar than a healthy cell does eight times because cancer what, what happens is that cells go through a life cycle and the last part of it is a cellular death called apoptosis if that doesn't happen this so what happens is 
a normal cell uses oxygen and, um, and other nutrients for, for fuel. When it dies, it stops getting that. But with cancer cells, they start getting their nutrients from things like sugar. So there's no nerve supply to cancer typically. It's, it's feeding off the sugar. That's why if they, if they think you have uh, cancer, they'll have you drink the liquid, do a PET scan. That liquid has a ton of sugar in it and they can watch it and it's gonna go right to the cancer, okay? And so it promotes cancer growth, promotes obesity, because the more we get, it just turns into, it turns into uh, fat cells. And it causes fatigue because our body just starts burning, trying to burn all that sugar all the time. It's going to burn what's easily available, readily available, and easy to burn, which is sugar. And if you think about it, we're constantly putting sugar into our body, and our body's constantly trying to burn the sugar. It never, ever gets to burn the fat. So if anyone's ever tried to lose weight, but they just do it by trying to exercise, you cannot out-exercise a bad diet. You really can't you have to start allowing your body to change its energy system from a sugar burning machine to a fat burning machine. And what happens is we, we tank throughout the day with fatigue because it, it runs through so quick and it doesn't know how to go to sugar or go to fat burning. Okay, so um, let, me, let me share this with you first. <clears throat> so this is what I typically ate um, as a kid. Actually, s'mores was my favorite pop tart. I look at it and still salivate because it's so good, right? Um, so, if I were to reach in here and pull out this package, it's like a, I don't know, like a chrome or silver package or whatever. If I open that up, what's inside that? How many pastries? Two. Two, right? And so in my household, we would actually, no joke, my dad would get onto us if we only ate one because we're wasting the other one, right? Someone would have to eat it. And so, if you look at the nutrition facts, the way this works is you have to, before even looking at what all is in here, you have to base see what they're basing it off of, the serving size. The serving size is one pastry. So all these numbers are for one of those pastries and they're not both of them, okay? So you have to basically double that if you're gonna eat both of them. So let's just go to the sugar content. Sugars, 19 grams. So in my breakfast, as a little kid, I was doubling the amount of sugar that my body could handle in one day, that an adult body could handle in one day, right? And so, and, and growing up, I was constantly, like I looked, looked, health does not have a look, by the way. I, I say that because everyone knows what I mean. Health has no look. It, it, I looked skinny. Everyone um, would always wonder if I was eating, but at the same time, I was constantly sick with allergies, headaches, Every time the season changed, um, I would get the flu or flu-like symptoms. Maybe not the flu, but flu-like symptoms. So I was constantly sick. I was in the hospital in, uh, what grade was I? Second grade. I was in the hospital for three days because I don't know what I had, but I was sick for like two weeks straight. They had to put IVs in me, pump, pump me with fluids and medicine. Um, so that was me. But at the same time, my body wasn't getting the fuel it needed. So this is a, a Kellogg's. I get, I'm guessing cereal, but it's a Kellogg uh, brand. The way these ingredient lists work is the thing that it names first up here is the most potent in that. So as we work down, so there's a lot of filling that they use in this. Filling is what that consists of and there's very little folic acid. So um, if you just go through this, this is a cereal box. So number one is filling, which is high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup. Um, there's artificial flavor in here, red number 40, blue number one. If you ever see like those colors on there, just throw it away. Those are, uh, they, those do cause cancer. They're carcinogenic. Um, that's one of the things, or that's what a lot of countries ban, by the way, those things, those additives. And they use it simply to give it color. That's all they use it for. But um, they've actually taken tumors out of uh, breast tissue and dissected them and found what they're made of and they're made of things like that, the additives. Not to just sort of food, but also to our deodorants and shampoos and soaps and all that stuff, household cleaners. Um, high fructose corn syrup again, artificial flavor again, soy. So the way they hide sugar is anything with OSB on it is sugar. So it's sucrose, fructose, dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, maltodextrin, which is maltose and dextrose put together. And so you have to really watch that because they hide it well in these numbers. One good rule 
to um, reading labels, not just for sugar, but for everything, is the longer the, the list on here, the worse it typically is. So it, regardless of what it is, if it's got a ton of ingredients, it's most likely not good for you. It's got a ton of additives in it. Because um, the rule I go off of is if God put it on this planet, then it's probably better for us than when we get a hold of it and switch it up. And God didn't make bread with all this, all this extra stuff in it, right? Um, so let's look at another... So I didn't really eat raisin bran. Raisin bran was more the healthy cereal in our house, and we didn't. I I didn't eat it. I think my mom might have. Might have but um, their their marketing is really good, so you have to be careful here because it's whole grain guaranteed, good source of fiber. It's got like bursting with raisins, raisins with starch. So it's very to the eye. You you could easily say that this is a healthier cereal, but if you turn it over, I don't even really read a lot of this. I mean, there's um, 20 grams of sugar in one serving which is one cup, and I'm sure most people eat more than one cup less at a time. But anyway, if you look at the ingredient list, there's probably 30 to 40 different ingredients on here. Number one being whole wheat, number two rice, number three sugar, and then there's sugar again on there at the top. So it's just filled with sugar. If you take something like this, and just going off the ingredient list, this thing has brown rice flour, evaporated cane juice, sea salt, and molasses. That's all that's in this thing. It probably tastes like cardboard. <laughs> not gonna lie, I'm not a big cereal eater anymore um, just because the, I, I can't, I don't wanna eat cardboard. That's just the way I am. Um, the way you would sweeten it up is a spoonful of sugar on it, and that's not good. So, um, where was I going? Um, you, you just wanna watch those ingredient lists. Number two, fix your fat. So I have a video here. Um, I'm gonna show you. I used to walk through a bunch of stuff with fats. This video is super funny and he covers a lot. Uh, I love this video because as he's making points in the corners of the screen, you'll see things pop up and that's the resource or the research where he got it from. Um, it's called Adam Ruins Everything. It's pretty funny. It just puts a, a comical spin on, on a serious issue. And it talks a lot about history too. So you gotta pay attention to where all this started. And, Cause it's nutrition, our nutrition right now is very money driven. And that's, that's mainly what it is. It's not health driven. It's very money driven. So um, you'll, you'll see here. And worse marketing. <laughs> That's ridiculous. When I eat fat, it goes in my body and becomes fat and fat is fat. Yeah, that's what everybody thinks, but it's not true. Oh, hey, an egg timer. People have been eating fat for as long as humans have existed, and their lives were swell. Fat tastes good. Also, salve for tiger wound. Okay, maybe not swell. The point is, fat is one of our oldest and most basic nutrients. Wow, thank you for the history lesson, Adam, but I need to lose weight. And the most important thing is for me to cut out fat. Yep, that's what the sugar industry wants you to think. Holy ham, buddy, you trying to give me a heart attack? Funny you should say that, because in the early 20th century, doctors began to notice a disturbing rise in a once rare condition called heart disease. Americans' hearts are failing. But where will the love go? And when President Eisenhower suffered a heart attack in 1955, it galvanized the nation. <gasps> Someone looked into this. <clears throat> Americans were determined to fight heart disease, but instead they were bamboozled by the sugar industry and one very suave scientist. This is Ansel Keys, a scientist so popular he once made the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> Keys was certain that fat was the cause of heart disease, but only because he cherry picked his data to get the result he wanted. This data is out of sight. This data can sit on it. Fat makes you fat. Hey! <laughs> Nobody cared. 
this research was bad? Not really. Except for one research was bad? Not really. Except for one slightly less popular scientist named John Yudkin. Actually, sugar is the likely culprit. When you eat more sugar than your liver can normally process, it's stored as fat. Hey, get a load of the nerd. <laughs> he used to mouth Yudkin and made fun of his research in public. <laughs> fat makes you fat. End the story. And people just believe this jerk? Yeah, because of a big assist from a group with a sickly sweet agenda, the sugar industry. In the 60s, these candy-coated capitalists started straight up paying scientists to downplay the dangers of sugar and shift the blame to fat. Here's a little something for that big fat problem we have. You got it, sugar. I mean, you the sugar industry, I wasn't calling you sugar. When John Yudkin spoke out against sugar in 1972, the industry publicly mocked him, calling his research science fiction. Now, now, we've been eating fat for millennia, but if we track the rise in sugar consumption, there's a clear correlation with the rise in heart disease and obesity. <laughs> if we track the rise of sugar consumption, live long and prosper, beep, beep, I am a sugar robot. <laughs> I am not a sugar robot. I'm not. The sad truth is, Yudkin was right. We now know that sugar is linked to both heart disease and weight gain, and it's been found to be more addictive than cocaine. But keys in the sugar industry spent so many years swaying the research that by the time Yudkin retired, the public was convinced. Despite being right the whole time, he died in obscurity. Science is a harsh business. And Big Sweet's relentless lobbying didn't stop there. They spent years packing health panels with sugar-friendly scientists. We need reliable, objective research. I've got just the man. That's bad. Their campaign reached its sugar height when the USDA officially recommended a low-fat diet in 1980. Fat is the enemy. Once everyone switched to low-fat foods, everyone started getting thinner, right? Quite the opposite. After the USDA came out against fat, obesity rates actually skyrocketed. <laughs> Why? Low-fat foods must help me lose weight. I mean, I'm cutting out something, right? Wrong. When you take the fat out, it makes food taste worse. So to make it more palatable, food companies typically add a little something. Piles and piles of sugar. Oh, this fat-free cake tastes like styrofoam, y'all. Sugar. And much better. <laughs> now, let's talk about why I think white sugar is superior brown. Okay, that's enough. Oh, yikes. But you said that sugar makes you gain weight. Exactly. The sugar industry peddled bad science and demonized fat in order to sell us more of the product that actually causes heart disease and weight gain. And now, eating so much sugar has made us fatter and unhealthier. And too snacky. Sorry, Sam. It's true. It's obviously tied a lot of uh, the stuff we talk about with sugar into that. Which, when it comes to fat and how we how we look at it since the 80s in our country, you cannot separate the connection between sugar and fat. You guys see, because as they remove the fat, they have to add the sugar. And so all the stuff that we just talked about, I mean, that's why we are seeing the disease rates that we are. Um, people think that, you know, fat makes you fat and it's not the case. In fact, the hormones in your body that for you to exercise and to eat right and to start to see things like weight loss or better sleep or diabetes go away, all that stuff, um, hormones have to be in play there. Well, guess what hormones are made of? Fat, fat and cholesterol. And so when you start to remove the fat, you're actually preventing your body from burning the fat. Um, so it, it's, it's a weird thing that we've been taught to believe. But again, if you, I mean, if, if if the whole fat-free craze, because everything you find is low fat, reduced fat, no fat, 2% fat. If that were the, making us fat, or if fat was making us fat, then we should start to see obesity rates go down, right? And so I'd like to take off sometimes this, the science hat and put on the logic hat with some of this stuff. Like, I don't care what some of the research says, because they can, 
They can cherry pick that all they want to make it say what they want it to say. But logic, logic is key. I mean, with a lot of this stuff. I mean, same, same thing with the whole um, statins and heart disease. It just doesn't make sense. Now, am I saying that you should get off your statins? I'm, I can't say that. But I would, I would challenge you to question um, the way we do things because a lot of people are on this stuff and it's, it's only making them sicker. So um, fix your fat is change number two because we still need fats, but there are good fats and there are bad fats. So here's some of the bad fats we do want to avoid. Anything that says hydrogenated or partially, partially hydrogenated on it. So usually it's your, your soybean oil, your vegetable oil, oils. Unfortunately, it's the cheapest oils that you can typically get. Um, you want to stay away from. And the reason for that is, is if they become rancid. And what do I mean by that? Um, oils, are, they have heat stability to them. And, and so these oils here are very non-heat stable meaning that whenever they get introduced to heat with the stove or even our bodies, 98 degrees, it can go bad very quickly. Things like canola oil, I know that that goes bad in the process of making it typically before it even gets put in the bottle, it's pretty rancid. So you wanna stay away from that. Um, anything like the synthetic butters or margarine, uh, the trans fats you wanna stay away from. Margarines, uh, they say it's one, one chemical away from being plastic. So uh, if you want to do a, a cool little research, maybe if kids or grandkids, you can take a paper plate, put real butter and put margarine on it and put it outside for the ants and see where nature goes. Ants will not touch what's not real. And so they will not touch margarine. So what do we eat? Good facts. So not altered by man. Uh, as much as possible. Extra virgin olive oil. Use that if you're not using heat. So extra virgin olive oil is not heat stable, so you can make that go bad um, if you do heat it. So we use that for like salad dressings, that type of stuff. Avocado, avocado oil, grapeseed oil, those are more medium heat. Um, I'm not a cook, so I don't know what medium heat even is, but I know that's the case. <laughs> so if you're a cook, High heat would be more like coconut oil, the, the saturated fats. Those are very heat stable. In our house, we get rid of the middle ground. So we'll use extra virgin olive oil and we use coconut oil. Because coconut oil you can use with medium or high heat. Um, and plus there's a thousand benefits and ways to use coconut oil, including we use it for uh, suntan or like a, a lotion when we're going out in the sun. Uh, uses moisturizer all that good stuff. You can use it to make toothpaste, deodorants. Uh, raw nut seeds and oils, excellent source of, of good fats. Real butter, um, real butter, a lot of people don't use that because the whole no fat craze or saturated fat is bad. I, just so you know, nutrition is my least favorite thing to talk about. I'll be upfront with you because with all the different research and lobbying and all that stuff, everything I say right now, you can go find doctors who say the opposite, right? So it's a, what do you believe? Like, where do you put your trust? But just understand that you have to know who's doing the research. Are they bought out? Are they trying to push an agenda? Because a lot of times it is. So that's why every decade it seems they'll say, oh, eat butter. And then they'll say, don't eat butter. And then they'll say, eat butter. They don't know. Butter's good, real butter. Raw cheese, yogurt. Uh, the dairy, if you're gonna do dairy, it's best to do raw. You, do, if, you're, if you want a good, healthy diet, you do not have to have any dairy. You really don't. <clears throat> I, I personally like dairy. I'll eat dairy, but you don't have to have it. Uh, Grass-fed meats, I'll go over that in a second. Uh, Pacific or wild-caught fit, fish, um, wild salmon, all great sources of fat. I have no idea what just happened. Do you remember when all the fish died in the Great Lakes? Do you remember when the Great Lakes started to die off in the 70s? Yeah. Do you remember when yeah, the fish were watching the tumors and they were sick? Did you remember the birds that ate those fish? That was weird. Okay. Number three, trash and toxins. So I'm going to get into um, some grass-fed versus grain-fed stuff. So. <clears throat> 
when it comes to meat, um, you don't have to eat meat to have a good diet. It, it, the problem with diets, whether it be you know um, keto or paleo or or the other one, there's like a North Beach or South Beach or whatever the case is, I don't do diets, but um, it's not the differences that make them work. They'll promote the differences in them, like what what you can can have. <clears throat> it's not the differences that make them work, because a lot of them do work. The problem is you only do them for like a month and then you go back to your ways. <clears throat> That's why I don't like diets. It's the similarities between them all that make them work. Um, the similarities are typically that they cut out a lot of processed foods and a lot of sugars. That's the similarities in most diets, okay? <clears throat> so um, regardless of whether, you're, you know, because the reason I say it is because there's a lot of, there's diets where um, some people just eat meat. They've been doing more research on that. <clears throat> but there, there is a head to tail diet. So you're eating like the liver and the organs and all that stuff too. Not a big fan of that. Um, there's vegetarians out there, there's vegans out there. There's a lot of research that points towards eating meat as promoting cancer, is promoting cancer. I don't know if you guys have seen that or not. Um, a lot of that research is done on grain fed meat though, is the problem. And I will agree 10 times over, yes, grain fed meat can increase your risk of cancer. And there's something called biotoxic accumulation that occurs in um, all food, but what that means is basically if you take a pound of, let's say a pound of produce and a pound of beef, you're gonna get a lot more toxins from the meat than you are the, the, the produce. So if you're, um, if you can't afford to change your whole pantry to um, organic or anything like that, I would start with meat first because you're gonna see a bigger benefit from not getting the toxins in there, okay? Because uh, again, they promote it promotes things like cancer growth. So, um, what are you getting in grass-fed cows? So, God put cows on this planet to eat grass, not grains. There's a lot of benefit to farmers to feed cows grains because it makes them uh, bigger. It uh, yields bigger, um, I guess, turnaround for them. But the problem is, is they have to pretty much put antibiotics in the feed because it makes them so sick because they're not made to, they're just like us, we're not made to eat grains, really. So, whenever you eat grass-fed, here's what you're getting versus grain-fed. You're getting higher amounts of vitamin E, B vitamins, um, omega-3s, CLA. So CLA is, stands for conjugated linoleic acid. Um, it, some people are calling it the anti-aging hormone. So if you have a lot of CLAs in your diet and then you have them in your body, it actually uh, slows down the aging process. As far as like wrinkles and I think of people like Dick Clark or Will Smith or people who just, you know, 30 years go by and they don't look like they age, but maybe five years. I guarantee those people, besides the Botox maybe, they have a higher amount of CLAs in their, in their system. Um, you get more antioxidants, which goes and kills free radicals. So it actually, instead of promotes cancer, it goes and kills cancer cells. But that's only if you're getting grass-fed. You have to really pay attention because usually there's a, like a little section, maybe the size of this wall right here in each grocery store that will have like your, your, your grass-fed stuff. Um, so, all right. Back to proteins, there's a lot of crossover with this, with the, the grass-fed stuff, but um, if we can get better protein in our diet, what our body will do, what you'll benefit from that is, is you'll have, uh, by increasing your diet or your fat and your proteins, your body's going to start switching to burning those for fuel and uh, things like fatigue, uh, fogginess, things like that's gonna start to go away for you. Um, headaches all that so here's good source of protein again if you're fixing your fats you're also going to be protecting your proteins for the most part so we kind of covered a lot of that raw butter cheese uh, I would say gra so grass-fed whey protein is a good source of whey protein is a good source of protein um, an even better one that we switched to is bone broth 
mainly because it uh, contains less sugar in it. Um, there's not a ton of sugar in, in the whey protein if it's grass fed, but there, it, it, it is a little bit higher. Um, okay, change number five, curb the carbs. So this is gonna go along a lot with, uh, with sugar, but more particularly to the grain side of it. The carbs that you get from your grains. Whenever I was in school, now they do the, the, the my plate thing, which I haven't really paid much attention to. I don't really care for it either. Uh, but they did the, the food pyramid back when we were younger. And the food pyramid, I didn't know it till maybe seven years ago. That's not backed by any type of scientific research. Did you guys know that the food pyramid's not? That is that was put together by farm farmers. And if you think about it, if you think about the, the whole bottom row that you should eat most of, what is it? It's like wheat and grain and all that stuff. Like just what we've talked about and what that does in terms of sugar and all, it's not backed by any type of science. Um, so if actually what we should do is flip the food pyramid and that would make it more scientifically accurate as far as what our body needs. So number one, water is the number one thing that we need. Uh, then you got your all your um, fruits and vegetables, and then you got your proteins, and then you got your healthy fats. And then if you wanna get rid of the top of that, you can, but you should get the least amount of those breads and stuff, okay? And, and that's where um, you're really gonna be building health. There are, you guys have handouts. Because a lot of people will be looking at this and be like, oh, well, I guess I'm never going to eat anything that I will ever want again, right? Or I guess i got to eat cardboard. On this, you have a seven-day meal plan and grocery list. So it's all, like, if you just go to the store and get this stuff, some of the prices might be a little bit off because this was put together a long time ago. Um, but then the application of what we're talking about is in this with how to actually put together meals. So you have a seven-day meal plan, everything from breakfast through snacks, through dinner of what to eat for those seven days. And you'd be applying everything we're talking about into your at least one week. And you can see that you don't have to deprive yourself of anything. So it's actually very, very good. There's a bunch of websites out there. DrAxe.com is one of my uh, big go-tos for any type of um, recipes or anything like that. I'm a big sweets person. So um, he's got a bunch of good desserts on there that are sugar-free and taste amazing. And then you also have this uh, lunch box and snack idea. So basically the way this works is you take one thing from each category here and you put it in a lunch box and it builds a healthy lunch. So uh, Dr. Matt's wife actually put that together um, as they were sending their kids to school they wanted to not have to think too much about it so they put that together. So you don't have to, don't look at this and get discouraged that you can't ever have anything you want again. But um, this, these are some nutritional uh, myths. We've kind of busted a lot of these and talked about them. So myth number one, eating fat will make you fat. Not true. Um, you actually need fat for mainly the hormones, okay? Also, our brain is made up of fat. So um, that's another thing that long-term stat use are finding is um, your body will actually start pulling from the wrong places. Because a, a, a pill doesn't have any intelligence. Like, when you put it in there, it doesn't know to go attack the cholesterol in your, in your arteries. I mean, it can pull it from the brain. Um, they're seeing that you have a higher risk of things like Alzheimer's and dementia with long-term statin use for that reason. Uh, myth number two, calorie counting. Can you do this and get good results? Absolutely. Do I hate it? Absolutely. I cannot stand calorie counting. I've never counted in calories a day in my life and I never plan on it. Because just doing calorie counting doesn't, you can, but usually a lot of people don't take into account the quality of the calorie. They're just looking at the quantity. My mom did this. I think Weight Watchers is different now, but when I was a little kid, um, instead of Subway and Walmart, you had McDonald's back then at some of the Walmarts. We lived in Popper Bluff at the time and they had it. And we would go to, uh, to Walmart and we'd always eat um, McDonald's. And my mom was doing Weight Watchers and she would eat a Big Mac and be like, oh, well, I can eat it because it's under the points for the day and that's all she would eat, right? And so she was following the diet by eating a freaking Big Mac. It's just, I didn't think anything at the time, but now I've had patients who've done really good with just forget calorie counting, just eat what God put on this planet to eat and follow these rules 
and they see really good results. And I've had several patients go back and like, oh, I want to do it because they get bored with stuff and that's just human nature. And they'll start calorie counting and then they'll backtrack. Like, stop, I just, I can't stand it. You might as well eat a Twinkie versus having 22 almonds if you're getting calorie count. Uh, sorry, that's, I, I can't stand it. So myth number three, if I eat clean, I don't need supplements, that's false. Um, unfortunately, we just cannot get everything we need out of our diet that our body needs. Um, our soil's depleted. Um, an apple today is not equal an apple back in the 50s and 60s. You don't get the same nutrients. You have to um, fill in the gaps. Even with a good, healthy, perfect nutrition plan, you still have gaps in there. And so you have to supplement. Do I think that some people take way too many supplements? 100%. Um, do I think that some people need more supplements than other? Absolutely. Uh, the four supplements that I recommend taking are vitamin D and probiotic. Probiotics go to a vitamin D because it helps activate it in the body. It helps with immune system and a ton of stuff, um, including cancer, uh, reducing risk of cancer. A good um, omega, omega-3, fish oil, and a multivitamin of some sort, and or greens. So we, I do greens and that takes the place of a multi, it's the same thing. Those are, the, we call them the core four. I think that everyone needs to be on at least those four things. Beyond that, you can do testing and figure out what else you need. Um, some people need more zinc and vitamin C and whatever. So, <clears throat> there's two, two main plans that I'm gonna hit on here. There's not a ton of differences in these. Advanced plan is more like, um, if you have anything going on uh, that's chronic, any type of pain, um, any type of disease, diabetes, cancer, whatever, or if you've never ever tried changing your diet and you've just kind of been going with the flow of what everyone else does, it's probably a good idea to do the advanced plan for at least a month. If you have a chronic disease going on, like diabetes or cancer, heart disease, you might want to think about doing advanced planning more like six months at least. Um, and what that does is you cut out all, it's a more of an elimination diet. You eliminate all grains, fruits, and sugars. Why do I say fruits? Because there's fructose in fruits. Are you going to die from eating too many apples? No. But for the best results to, for your body to heal, this also I call it the healing diet, is for you to reset your hormones completely. And the way to do that is no sugar whatsoever, even from fructose. So, um, the way I compare this to is like if, you're, if your computer's messing up, I don't know anything about computers, but if this thing messed up, I know if I hit the power button and hold it until it shuts down and I give it a minute and turn back on it, like it reboots it for some reason and it fixes most problems. <laughs> I don't understand it. The way we do that with our body, if our hormones are all off, our pancreas is working right, or we have something called leptin, which is a satiety or a hunger hormone that um, too much carbs and sugars will actually suppress that, just like the insulin gets suppressed in the pancreas. Um, that's why we always are hungry all the time, is because we're leptin, uh, we have what's called leptin burnout, it's the hormone. If you wanna reset any of this stuff, eliminate sugar, it's like hitting the power button and, and re let it reboot turn back on your body. I mean, it's crazy what happens if you're able to do that. Is it simple? Yes. Simple. It's like, oh, not a big deal. Just cut out all grains, fruits and sugars. Is it easy? Absolutely not. Three days in, you're going to want to, you're going to be hangry and not want to talk to anyone. But the, the long-term results is worth it. And then there's a core plan, which basically is like this one, but you're allowing yourself to have more um, healthier like a nine grain bread, more grains. Um, you can add in the, the fruits back in because the good vitamins and micronutrients of fruit is very, very important for our diet. I would never recommend cutting fruit out of your diet forever. Um, so you start adding that stuff back in. It's a little bit more doable because uh, you're, you're just allowing yourself, especially if you haven't had sugar in that long, like fruit is like a piece of candy at that point. And so it's really good. I actually did not like so I went on advanced plan, 
I've been on it several times. Uh, one time I follow it very, very strictly for a month and I started liking things I have never liked. Like peppers was a big one, peppers and mushrooms. Um, I was never liked peppers and now I love them. I can cut up a pepper and eat it by itself or all. Love it. I have no idea why that happened, but it just it changes your palate. Okay, here's some, some places in our area. I need to update this because especially with this whole COVID thing, some of these places might not be around anymore. Um, like Beefo Brady's is closing. I think they're maybe close after Monday. Um, some of these places are in St. Louis, like Trader Jones and Whole Foods, but just some places you can get um, some of the ingredients and better stuff. Like it, what we do is if we go up to St. Louis, we'll, we'll stockpile some stuff from like Whole Foods. That way we don't have to go up there all the time. Um, I would add, oh, I already added McAllister's Deli on there. Um, okay, let me get it all together. So eat fat at every meal, very important. Um, it also allows you not to overeat because you're actually getting good calories in. Uh, protein at breakfast, this is gonna help with the, the, the crash midday. Um, it's also gonna help with satiety, making you feel fuller longer. Eat slowly, eat slowly. I'm telling this to myself because I'm horrible at this. Um, in my household growing up, if you didn't eat quick, you didn't eat much. So um, my wife always asks if I got food in my lungs because I eat so fast. But eat slowly because it takes 20 minutes to feel full. Um, read the ingredient list, less is best, and meal prep for the week. That will make or break you. You, you could get a lot from today and really leave here saying, okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a change. Like I'm gonna do advanced plan for a month or whatever. If Sunday rolls around and you got work on Monday and you don't meal prep for at least a couple days, it'll break you. I don't care what your mindset is leaving here, how much motivation you got, whatever. We live off of convenience, right? If you go buy McDonald's at noon on any given day, there's People, the, the drive through is backed up. I guarantee everyone in that drive through knows that they're not feeding their body good food when they're eating that stuff, right? But it's more convenient um, than not eating. So um, you have to meal prep. This all plays a, a big role in our health as well as everything else. So what I always tell people is you can, you can tell how important something is to the body for your health by how long you can go without it. So if you've ever watched Survivor, you know that you know those people go like a month with very little food. So you can go probably months without food. Some of us can go longer. Uh, you can go days without water, so therefore water is more important than food. You can only go minutes without air. So we know air is, is more important to our body and it helps in water, but you cannot go one single second without nerve supply. You just can't. The way our body um, recognizes and digests food is through our nervous system. So the brain, the spinal cord, and those nerves that constantly tell. And that's why adjusting the spine is so vitally important and goes right with everything we talk about with nutrition and exercise and all that stuff. Um, the way I, I compare it, it's like, this is like our engine, right? So our spine is our engine. It runs everything. The food is our fuel, right? So if you have a really good engine, I could adjust you to the cows come home, but if you're going and eating McDonald's every single day, I don't expect you to get off medication. I don't expect you to feel as good as you could if you change that. So you cannot have a good engine and put crappy fuel into it. And you cannot have the best fuel in the world and put in a bad engine and expect that car to run. Does that make sense? It goes hand in hand. You can't separate it. And what I do is I don't talk about this stuff to, with any type of agenda other than trying to get people to live a healthier, longer life, not just for them, but for their family. That's what it's all about. <clears throat> so here, I'll leave these up here, but these are the five core changes that we talked about. So slash your sugars, fix your fats, trash your toxins, perfect your proteins, and curb your carbs. And again, do not, please, do not try to do all of them at once. If you've ever, especially if you've ever tried like a diet change and, and failed, or it didn't go as good as you thought it would, do not try to do them all. You have to protect this. I would say even if you do 
unless you're in some dire need of doing the advanced plan and rebooting everything for a month. If you just leave here and start doing the advanced plan every once in a while throughout the week, still allow yourself to have a cheat meal, at least one a week, okay? Because you can do something really good, like motivation will last you for a little bit, but then that motivation goes away and you get tired of doing that and then you'll go back. Because if you're trying to be perfect with everything and say you are for a month, your motivation is going to run out and you're, you're not protecting your mind then. Your mind controls, I mean, your mindset controls you to do everything, okay? And so um, that's my encouragement for you guys that, you know, you can still have a cheat meal. Please do that. Um, we have this book, or we can order it too, that has a bunch more recipes in it. Uh, and it, it spec uh, tells you whether it's advanced plan or core plan approved. And so it, it's information in the front too, more so than what I just went into. But um, very good book there. So do we have any questions?